Hello everybody, this is James DeBone, the Scoverton, dedicated to original peoples as always. We've got a special guest on, Professor Robert Connell. How are you doing, my brother? I'm doing very well and it's a pleasure to be on today. Uh, welcome to the show anyway. You know, we're um, introduced by Professor Small, you know, um, great colleague, uh, great professor. And it's interesting to have you on. You know, we've been waiting to have this discussion for maybe a little while now. But anyway, we're going to be dealing with the topic of the Maroons in Jamaica and also Suriname, which I have thought was very interesting, Suriname as well. So if you could give us a little beginning of your background and, um, you know, how you got to where you got to today. Yeah, absolutely. So I am from uh, uh, Toronto, uh, Toronto region in southern Ontario here in Canada. Um, I started my undergraduate degree uh, in the early 2000s in environmental studies. Now, where I was coming from was of a child of, of two immigrants um, in, in Canada at that time. My mother's uh, from Jamaica, my dad is from Scotland, and uh, my mother actually has maroon ancestry herself. It's, it's a little distant, you know, she never lived in a maroon community or had direct connections it was more by that point family lore you know and legends and that history passed down so as I was growing up I think I I in particular gravitated towards that family legacy because I was raised in a you know especially those times um, in this part of Canada uh, very white uh, uh, very monoculture you could say I was one of the few uh, people of color uh, at all in my in my schools growing up uh, let alone somebody of 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 black, you know, uh, African and Caribbean uh, descent. So, you know, in order to to resist, push back, cope with some of the othering and the alienation, like I just developed this strong, you know, fascination. And I think probably like for many people in the African diaspora as a whole, uh, we have to put up with uh, with, you know, so much discrimination, so much, uh, uh, you know, historical erasure, uh, diminishing of, of our people's accomplishments. So this almost grandiose, too good to be true story of these, uh, these guerrilla warriors beating the pants off the entire British Empire was like, all right, that, 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 that was a, you know, very heartening and inspiring story. So, so flash forward a bit, you know, as a young man, I'm, I, I'm gravitating to environmental studies. Uh, I grew up in a quite polluted part of the country. So that was, you know, quite on my mind, wanted to do something about it, wanted to learn like, hey, why is it like this? What can we do to have a cleaner uh, living environment uh, uh, for ourselves as a community? And um, through that, now this is a huge topic I won't go so much into now, but, you know, we know that the basis of, of the Canadian state, the Canadian nation, as we understand it, is built on colonialism. It's built on the dispossession of indigenous. Uh, here, we often call them First Nations. Uh, uh, more archaically, we would have just said Indians. But but yeah, First Nations people dispossessed of their land but and forced onto reservations in many cases. But uh, from those reservations, still, you know, fighting back for their, for their cultures, for their livelihood. And in particular... Um, for the the right to stop development projects, which were seen as environmentally or culturally destructive. This could have been forestry, could have been mining, um, sometimes even just land taken from reservations to, to build new housing subdivisions. So, so through environmental studies uh, at York University here in Toronto, which, uh, you know, at the time I was, I was in the cohort as an undergrad, was, you know, quite a radical uh, program. We had Indigenous scholars, you know, teaching us about Indigenous history and struggle, and as an activist too, as a, as a young man coming up as a, as a radically minded person, again, strong motivation and inspiration to help my community, help the world from all these ills, um, I myself became involved in, in Native solidarity work. Um, Interesting. Uh, so that often entailed, especially as an outsider, um, an Indigenous community would put up a blockade 
somewhere to stop, you know, something, again, one of these development projects or land theft from happening, and they call for outside support. So it was just about having more people on the ground, you know, to help out and you know, kind of show a force. So so that was a, a part of my activism. Anyways, you know, we're talking kind of mid 2000s here. And just Again, I have never at that point I visited, but I'd never lived in Jamaica or anything, but, you know, still through family connections and, and, and just trying to keep up with what's going on in the island. I started to hear these stories about, wait, Maroons are fighting mining in cockpit country. Um, uh, for your for your viewers who might not be familiar with Jamaica, cock, the cockpit country is an interior uh, mountainous region of, of Jamaica. Um, you know, we would be saying St. Elizabeth, uh, St. James Parish, um, and spreading out to, to other parts of that, that island um, that's very rugged uh, jungle, jungle terrain, which the Maroons claim as their historical uh, territory. Uh, and so I started, you know, in the gleaner and observer and just through word of mouth started to hear about this conflict that was that was brewing and I just wanted to learn more at first I'm like well this is fascinating and and from what I'm reading there's some very similar lines here of 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 what I am experiencing happening in Canada um, that the Maroons have a claim to territory. They even have a treaty, you know, which is being violated. So they, you know, so they're saying by the, the Jamaican government and these uh, mining companies, specifically in Jamaica, it's bauxite mining, um, which is the mineral precursor to aluminum. It's uh, it's a very destructive form of mining, mining strip, you know, strip mining. If you, if you, again, for those who have been to Jamaica or other parts of the world that have bauxite mining, it's these like big strips of just red barren wasteland from where they they remove the ore for further processing. So uh, not hard to understand why the Maroons wouldn't want that to happen in one of the most uh, uh, pristine and well preserved uh, 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 jungle regions left in the Caribbean. You know, so so. Yeah. I started to put these things together and be like, wait a second, there's some, although, you know, hundreds, thousands of miles apart, you know, and, and very different societies. Um, uh, there's some type of common struggle happening between Maroon, with Maroons in Jamaica uh, and native folks here in Canada. And I wanted to learn more. And at the end of the day, beyond a few media articles there was nothing there there was really nothing being written about this at all and so that coincided with part of my motivation to to go into graduate studies um, well uh, what, what what's yeah. very interesting is um funny you said about the indigenous people you will learn about in canada mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. because i study a lot of indigenous peoples i do a lot of traveling around the world um, i'll go into secluded areas long drives and different territory, rainforests, whatever. And I try, I try to learn about them from whether it's creation stories or study how long these people have been there for, you know, study the culture, um, spirituality, you know, many different things and that. Now in Canada, it's interesting, I mean, because I mean, Canada, America, I mean, sometimes from the outside, we look at it as one in the same. Sure. Now, what about, one of the few things I want to ask you is one, um, the difference between Canada and America, mm -hmm. as far as, um, <clears throat> well, indigenous rights, I mean, I, I imagine it might be a bit similar, I'm, I'm sure you'll tell me. And also, the racism which you get in the United States and Canada, is it uncomparable or is it very similar in Canada? Yes, yes. And racism towards Native folks uh, uh, mm. between the two societies. Well, let me start with your first question. Um, you know, when we're talking Canada and the United States, very similar, um, very parallel histories of colonialism genocide frankly um there's there's that's that's just a, a matter of fact and um and uh land dispossession being forced onto reserves in fact by often the same people right if we go back long enough into the 18th century uh uh the 13 colonies of the united states and canada were all part of the british empire so yeah. so so we're talking you know more or less the same colonial project with you know certain perhaps regional variances but it all led up 
to the um, the the mass killing and dispossession of of native people in both Canada and the United States, and there has always been resistance uh, against that. In fact, um, you know, we can think of, uh, just to bring up a couple of the most prominent examples, right? Uh, 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 Chief Sitting Bull in the, in the United States and the Red River Rebellion in, in Canada, which is now we call the province of Manito uh, Manitoba. Um, uh, there was a Métis, uh, one of the, the uh, uh, indigenous societies here in Canada, uh, uprising around the time of confederation here in the 1860s. And so very uh, uh, parallel histories where I think there has been a divergence, um, especially in the later part of the, the uh, 20th century. And I must admit, I'm far from an expert in this specific topic, but uh, I'm going to just share my general understanding uh, of it, that in Canada, because of dynamics around the, the preservation of traditional governments uh, uh, among uh, uh, Native communities here on the reservations, what we might call traditional band councils um, uh, locally, that the Native folks here were able to start to wield a certain power and a certain uh, official authority in the the governance of Canada as a whole. Uh, it wasn't great, uh, uh, for sure. It was still a process of dispossession, but at least the Canadian government was giving lip service to some type of, okay, yeah, we, we know you have treaties. We, we, we know you have your own distinct, you know, social formation, uh, uh, decision-making processes, uh, such that sure, I guess when it serves us, we're willing to have, to have, uh, uh negotiations about certain things, you know, sort of like and, a form of reparations kind of, is it? That's what it came to eventually. But so okay. because, you know, generations of first nations, uh, indigenous activism and resistance in Canada, Canada, you know, built like on the basis of also that official representation, were able to push the Canadian government into a process of reparations, which is still ongoing, far from perfect. Nowadays, a lot of that is pivoted around um, um, residential schools. So again, this is a massive topic. It's one of the biggest topics in Canada right now. So I couldn't possibly do it justice in a few minutes. But very long story short is that as, you know, part of the process of, of, of genocide. And you know, I'm not just being hyperbolic here. I, I, these are like United Nations, like, like a world court, you know, understood definitions of genocide uh, uh, for, for decades, generations. Uh, the Canadian government, Canadian police forces, uh, in collaboration with local churches, including the Catholic Church, took indigenous children away from their families um, and put them in these residential schools, uh, which uh, so-called, you know, like, like, uh, this is a terrible statement. I'm quoting here, you know, the justification was, well, we want to kill the Indian, but save the man, right? That's what they used to say, that they would uh, turn these, these, uh, uh, you know, uncivilized people into into citizens or or whatever. You know, the justification uh, 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 was always spurious, but in any case, the result was a tremendous amount of systematic abuse uh, to the point of of mass killings um, that happened. And now, again, Canada is in a situation where we are uncovering more and more mass graves of of again children. Uh, this is a very depressing subject, but it's it's the reality um, around these former uh, residential school sites, such that there is a process for reparations now. And I would say, and you know, this is just my subjective opinion, having lived in both countries, that the Canadian, you know, native communities, at least at this point, are able to wield more power 
and 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 a stronger voice that's taken more seriously now by Canadian society as a whole. I think in part because the legacy of these traumas, of these crimes, you know, so much pushes against most Canadian self-image of being, oh, we're a very progressive, kind, gentle society. We're not like the Americans who are violent and, and brutal yeah. or don't have the history. Well, this just blows that apart. So whereas, and again, this is my uh, not being an expert in this specific field, but just my experience and observations living in the United States is that on the levels of, of U.S. government, federal government discourse, they don't care at all. Um, 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 they are not about to to entertain conversations with uh, with uh, indigenous communities about reparations or or getting land back. There's a grassroots movement for that. Don't get me wrong. There's a very powerful and inspiring grassroots movement for that in the United States. It's just not taken very seriously. On the a very way. slow process where like Canada's actually made them steps at least. I mean, if you compare the two, you know, mm -hmm, more. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, exactly, precisely. I would have thought that anyway. I mean, that's one of the reasons why I asked it, because I know even though people might, okay, it's all North America, but it's not necessarily, it's two di completely different countries. It's very similar, obviously, the way it was colonized, of course, most definitely. Yes. Now, if we um, deal with the Maroons now, uh, we're dealing with um, Jamaica and Southern yes. now. Where I want to begin with the Maroons is... What's the what's the beginning of the Maroons? I understand the transatlantic slave trade. Yes. People brought to Jamaica, Trinidad, Southern Ireland, and many other places. So where did the title come from, uh, Maroons? Also, what, what made them Maroons? Yeah, and, that's yeah. and also, I'm quite interested there. I mean, I hear different things about the Maroons. Some people have their own version. Some people say that the Maroons helped the Europeans capture slaves, and then mm. there's other versions of it. I'm sure you've heard these things mm -hmm. yourself, mm -hmm. but I'd like to hear it from someone who's really gone in depth of these studies. You know, this is why it's you're an interesting person to have on. Yeah. yeah so the beginning of the Maroons and how people called the Maroons and, and what they did. Yes, exactly. That's a that's a great series of questions, um, and I'll start at the very beginning. So, so the Genesis of Maroon struggle is directly tied to the origin of enslavement in the New World, in the Western Hemisphere. The first recorded act of what we call Maroonage, the process of becoming a Maroon or, or engaging in Maroon's resistance, is dated back to 1502 in the Spanish colony of Hispaniola. That was the first European colony um, um, set up by Columbus himself in 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 that very early period of uh of Dominican invasion. Republic. No. Yes, now Dominican Republic yeah, and okay. Haiti. Yeah, share the island. And it was Haiti, a yeah. united Spanish colony at that time. Okay. Uh, of course, a very emergent uh, uh, colony. And the first uh boatload or contingent of uh, African slaves brought over to to be forced to work in that colony. Um, some of those numbers escaped, uh, uh, fled, and uh, and ran into the hills. So it is said by the Spanish um, with the Taino uh, indigenous folks who who were also you know still resisting against Spanish uh, Taino, occupation. Yeah. So that's the very origin, and that's the origin of the word. There is some so James. There is some debate about this. The the, mm. the prevailing viewpoint among uh, uh, historians and people who are dealing with the etymology of the word maroon uh, are fairly certain it comes from Spanish colonial slang, cimarron, cimarron, which uh, means sort of just something wild, escaped, fugitive. It connotes that. Okay. Um, it seems like it was a very pejorative word at first. They they also said that of cattle who had run away. You know, they were they were maroons. Now now having said that, there is another uh, school of thought, or at least another scholar who has posited that cimarron even descends from a Taino word uh, for 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 fugitive or somebody who has run away. Uh, uh, to somewhere or from something. Uh, but again, most definitions will place it with uh, the Spanish word 
Cimarron, uh, from which we get the English word maroon, and also French uh, marron uh, as well. Um, so yes, so that was uh, the beginning. And wherever slavery, wherever the slave system put its foot, you had that form of resistance. Um, you know, again, this is a massive topic, but basically, uh, uh, you name it, uh, uh, Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, Jamaica, Suriname, Guyana, uh, even Mexico, um, um, even the United States, right? Yes, yeah, there were uh, maroon communities. Um, um, now, you know, we think of the the kind of, especially if we're talking Jamaica and Suriname. You know, we're thinking of the ones who were ultimately successful that they they wrested their freedom, you know, away. Um, and in the case of these two countries, which I did my field research in, still exist as, you know, distinct incorporated societies to this very day. It wasn't often like that for most Maroons because, you know, that form of resistance was so powerful and such a destabilizing force for the slave system, for the plantation economies, that these European empires would pour incredible amounts of resources to try to destroy them. And, and, you know, frankly, more often than not, they were successful. Um, these but were any all... of these, um, Maroon, see, like you've got, you were talking about Suriname and Jamaica, for example. Yes. Now, you're talking about, of still today, the descendants yes. of the Maroon, yes. you can see clearly in, yes. in, is it in a particular geographical area of these countries. Yes. Still, still there. Yes, now, yes, still, still there. And are these, would you say that these are quite, well, wealthy can compare to most of the other people how are the how are the like financially at the moment is it oh that's a very good question um you know i will start with jamaica um in this where uh they face many of the same problems as any other rural Jamaican community, uh, lack of wage labor, lack of good infrastructure. Uh, I think in part, you know, the dynamics of maroon struggle were such that these communities were set up in the most remote parts of the country, right? The most difficult to access. So let me tell you, when I first went up to Akompong, Jamaica, which is a community in the in the cockpit country, in the parish of, uh, of St. Elizabeth, and I, I took that taxi up the road oh my god i was i was a little terrified you know you have washed out road sheer drop you know uh unreliable electricity uh unreliable or non-existent um um piped water so it's a it's a complaint it's a it's a it's a consistent complaint from these communities uh the maroon communities in jamaica that they're not you know getting uh, enough aid uh from the the island's uh, uh government now having said that and you know we're getting a bit into the into the strong details here um um uh but uh maroon society though is organized in such a way that there's communal land tenure so that in itself is a type of security that you might not get as a, as another rural Jamaican, uh, for instance. And there's a parallel to Suriname. I'll get to that in a moment. Where you know the 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 plots of land that your father worked and grandfather worked, you're probably going to work too. There's nobody that can come in and take that from you. You know, uh, if you need a little more land or something, or you're working on a project, you work with your neighbors. You work with the 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 maroon. You know, local government to figure that out so actually in that sense there is a a a sense of, of of security and something the maroons are very much wanting to to preserve as opposed to the more what we would say like private market you know uh uh, uh economics of land where it's just all divided so it's, a, it's interesting it sounds, and no problem yeah it's interesting because it sounds like um a group of people the maroons and there's, there's some sort of unity like a strong unity with them, um, yes. you know, whereas some people, you know, they just fend for self. Yes, it seems yes. like there's some sort of unity. And another and, thing um, yeah. I wanted to ask, did the Maroons ever connect with other Maroons in different countries that were nearby? Ah, Could yes, yes, yes. That's, that's a, that's a wonderful wondering. question. Yeah. Very insightful. Uh, did, yeah. Okay, so let me let me back up a sec, because I want to talk just a moment more about the unity and... Yeah. and 
really like, you know, not taking that for granted, but where that came from. And, and in that way, I'll explain a little bit more about the dynamics of maroon struggle. Um, so, you know, again, these, these uh, life or death, uh, guerrilla wars, basically against uh, uh, both the British Empire in Jamaica and the Dutch Empire uh, in Suriname. And these communities, in order to survive, have to be so organized and have to have such common cause. There is a term, and this is very important to know, and this is actually across maroon societies, they have a concept called first time. Uh, first time was the period in, again, maroon the Maroons community's own historical consciousness that their ancestors, you know, uh, emerged from, that their societies were really forged in this struggle, in this common cause. And people could have come from all over different parts of West Africa and not speaking even the same language necessarily, you know. Uh, you could be yeah. Igbo or, or, or Ashanti, you know, uh, a Khan or Congo, right? But, uh, but there, was, there were actual ceremonies to unite people in those times so that they could have a better chance of survival and have a unified army against the against the uh their their uh the, the slaveholders uh basically so that runs so deep and and maroons to this day do point back to that first time period as really the time when their ancestors found their strength and that's passed on uh, to to this day in 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 everything that they do now that those struggles had unintended consequences and and that also exists to this day so again i'm jumping over a lot of history here but uh, but um uh, you know very briefly so in roughly the same time period by the close of the 18th century you know we're talking the last quarter of the 1700s uh the british in jamaica and the dutch in suriname are realizing that we can't beat these people we're there they're they're well armed. They're a guerrilla movement, you know. Uh, in fact, many of the captives coming from from Africa were prisoners of war themselves. So would have actually had military training uh, back in West Africa, and it showed, you know. Meanwhile, you know, European soldiers they did they couldn't fight in that kind of landscape. They were dying of disease, anyways, you know, in a climate that was hostile to them, and these. Colonial governments were realizing that they're going to lose. You know, they're already yeah. losing. They can't yeah. beat these people, and so they s eventually signed treaties um, um, with them. And in, in, in Jamaica, that was 1739. Uh, the British finally came to terms with the with the Maroons. One of the terms, and this still has far-reaching consequences to this day, was that in exchange for your freedom and for this land as your territory and we leave you alone, um, you have to act as a, a slave catching force for us from now on. Anybody else running away, you have to return to us. And there's so much that could be said about that, James. Like, yeah, I, it's not I that understand. simple at that yeah, particular yeah. time as well. You know, um, yeah. at the end of the day, there's always a whole lot more to it where some people see it as like, oh, they shouldn't have done that. But then some people see it, well, this is the cards they were dealt with, basically. And I, and, 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 yeah, and, and James, that's more like, A, I feel like I am not anybody to judge. I never walked a day in their shoes. Like, as we said, these were, as victorious as they were, these were extremely difficult struggles. I mean, people fleeing yeah. plantations after years of abuse with nothing but the clothes on their back, if that, still yeah. finding a way to fight, and somebody gives you the chance, okay, you can survive, you can live except for this one catch and and you know it was a diplomatic necessity i think that's interesting an interesting thing for you when you mentioned about um, the early 1500s mm -hmm. so now this is very early dealing with the spanish you know yeah. so oh, yeah so understand that so many africans were brought over quite early by the spanish in the early 1500s maybe even the late 1400s and so what we're dealing with here is Eventually, more Africans are going to be brought over to yes. the Caribbean, whether it was the 17th century, whether it was the 18th century. I mean, there must be more, there's more different, because it's not just one way it comes to one country. I mean, yeah, yeah. Do you understand? So, yeah. So, would, would there be like a separation with some of these uh, descendant of slaves 
ones that they're bringing over in the early 1500, they're going to be speaking Spanish. I mean, oh, um, yeah, you know, and also then the Dutch get involved, the British get involved. There's yes. all these different linguistics, you know, and then yes. there's different mentality, even though they're all European, the culture is slightly different. The Spanish had their way, the Dutch had their way, the British had their way, even though they're very similar in, in many cases colonialism, slavery, but still Spanish culture is slightly different because not you, you had the Moors not long in Spain. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. You know, so not to go too deep into that, but the culture is slightly different, even though they're, they're basically doing the same thing. So that's how I was just wondering, like, as um, the years went by and more people were brought over in the transatlantic slave trade, there must have been, like, some sort of... Um, if you settle in a country very early, then even if people from your own descent are coming over 100 years after you or 200 years or whatever it may be, yeah. you would already be well settled in that country. Yeah. And newer people, not saying, oh, well, these are the immigrants now because all Americans are practically immigrants, but it would have been a different mentality. So it's interesting to see how the Maroons formed so early and in Jamaica, Southern, and to this day, yes, you can still see the unity and connection with the Maroons. Yes. And that's why I was asking you before, as we wanted to go to the next question about, is there a connection with some of these Maroons in different countries? Which are very right. interesting. Yeah. Nowadays, there yeah. is. But that's a very modern um, 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 phenomenon with a few notable exceptions I'll, 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 I'll make. Um, um, you know... There is some evidence, it's not quite an open and shut case, but, you know, there is some evidence, and I'm just going to bring up this example, that during the period of the Haitian Revolution and the lead up to it, and if we think about our geography here, actually Jamaica is quite close to, to, to Haiti. You could, if you know where you're going and you're, you're a strong seaman, you can get a, a day's canoe, you know, a uh, yeah. trip will have you in southern Haiti. Um, that some Maroons um, um, went to Haiti and linked up with Maroons there. And in part of the the fermentation of that of that struggle, again, that's as much perhaps legend as any like verifiable like well, historical but evidence. You say, but but would, those histories are there. Those histories. Would you say before that they linked with the Tianos? And Tiano, exactly. And these yeah. people could move by boats when they were the cars. Yes, the other ones, yes, they, yes. they would move about. And in the and in the uh, uh, the lesser Antilles, you know, like we're talking like Barbados, uh, Trinidad, Saint Vincent, uh, uh, the smaller islands of the Caribbean, there was a phenomenon of maritime marinage, where were not just fleeing the plantation, but people were able to 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 take to boats to go to other parts uh, where they thought they could get more freedom. Um, and in fact, you also have the history there of the Garifuna. Um, um, or the Black Caribs, you know, said of of definitely like a, an actual merger of of West African and formerly enslaved people and the local indigenous societies uh, coming together and fighting against European oppression. So definitely those type of connectivities uh, uh, existed. Then again, there was a lot of barriers, of course, like like still it was very hard to move around. If you're at war, you can't really leave. <laughs> like it's, it's not so you can't just go about. Nowadays, because Maroons... You know, and I've talked about Jamaica, I've talked about Suriname, and I've talked about indigenous struggle. Like these dynamics around land theft, resource extraction, um, um, all of that are, are common in the Americas. Like, like this is part of indigenous existence. This is part of what I would say also Afro-indigenous existence. Uh, I do situate Maroons as a form of Afro-indigeneity. And increasingly, there's now with globalization and the internet and better ability to travel people are making links and uh and maroons in suriname and jamaica are definitely talking with each other they're interested in the maroons in the Bra in brazil the quilombolos what they're doing uh the pelenqueros in colombia and not just with other maroons but also the native folks in those societies as well who are struggling often against the exact same forces um so it only makes sense and i and i see that as as 
increasing just over time uh increasing especially as as you know my own specific focus uh the conversation between maroons and in jamaica and suriname was virtually non-existent when i first started my field research in in the 2010s and nowadays it's 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 actually you know you have people visiting back and forth uh, quite regularly Um, interesting though yeah very yeah. interesting you know um i mean i always hear about the marine place like jamaica but southern was very interesting as well um you know right next door to french guyana guyana yeah. you know um so have you actually traveled to southern yourself yes yes i yeah. have yeah yeah it was so um again with the with the Uh, wonderful advice and mentorship of Professor Stephen Small, who was uh, who was actually uh, uh, my uh, uh, doctoral uh, advisor. So so we're we're quite close. He 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 taught me uh, quite a bit. At first, I was only looking at Jamaica uh, when I came into the graduate program, and he encouraged me to make it a comparative study uh, between Suriname and uh, and Jamaica. Because through his own connections, and we're making the links through Afro-European, you know, studies and the Dutch world uh, in particular in the former uh, Dutch Empire, it was like, you really have to look into this because the parallels are so uh, strong. So, so sure enough, I went, yes, I, I, I lived in, in Suriname. I was mainly based in the capital city of Paramaribo and then went to the maroon communities of Mungo. Mungo was the epicenter of mining. in Suriname and uh, causing a great amount of environmental destruction and dispossession of the Maroon communities uh, who live there. And um, um, uh, to this day, it's, it's, a, it's a struggle in the society. Now, maybe I'll, I've talked about the parallels, you know, in terms of resistance, uh, both past and present, uh, both enslavement and history, and then now resource extraction. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the differences, too, uh, because there has been a, a, a divergence in strategy. Again, I'll be I'll be pretty brief about this. But um, um, in Jamaica, the Maroons remained fairly politically isolated. That is to say that uh, up until recent times, you know, it was in the interest of the colonial government and the early independent government in Jamaica and in the interest of the Maroons to kind of just leave each other alone and not really engage with each other. It was far off. Nobody wanted nothing to do with the cockpit country, you know, so so so, so they just kind of kept to themselves a bit until tensions really came up in the early 2000s. Uh, Very interesting discussion anyway. Um, you know, if you want to finish up what you were saying, it was very yes, interesting, I, I thought. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So I was talking about some of the differences between uh, uh, Jamaican Maroon and Surinamese Maroon uh, politics and resistance in the current period. And what I found in my research was that because of the relative, at least, um, um, you know, political isolation within Jamaica that the uh, Maroon community of Akompong had up until, you know, the, the mining crisis in the, in the, in the early 2000s I, I was talking about uh, uh, earlier. Um, the, the Maroons there were content and still it's a plank of their strategy to preserve their governance structure. So again, very briefly, uh, again, dating back to the days of the, of the war for freedom, uh, a Maroon leader in Jamaica is called a colonel, and then you have a deputy colonel, and then, you know, kind of the the military ranks below that, uh, uh, and they're elected. They never used to be. It was an appointment for life, but starting in the, the late 1940s, they were uh, elected. So, so they have very much their own um, um, socio-political structure. And, and it is very much the maroon position in Jamaica today that they are a sovereign state, almost a state within a state. And this is very incendiary stuff in Jamaica to say. Uh, in fact, most recently, there was almost open conflict uh, around this, that the Maroons are, are declaring the statehood and the Jamaican government categorically rejects it. Uh, you know, again, that's a huge conversation in its own right. Uh, I'll just maybe sum it up with a quip that I often heard in Akompong that saying that, wait, our government was founded 
you know, 300 years ago, 1739, the Jamaican government was founded in 1967, you know, 50 years ago, or sorry, sorry 1969, I should say, uh, uh, 30 years ago at the time, who are they to tell us what to do, you know, so, so there's that disjuncture. Things were similar in Suriname up until the 1980s, where you had these, again, a traditional uh, governance structure, a chieftainship, if you will, among different Maroon communities in Suriname that likewise in Jamaica had stretched back hundreds of years to the period of first time. Um, and then a major catastrophe happened. So in the 1980s in Suriname, you had what they called the Interior War. Um, in the 1980s, there was a military dictatorship under uh, 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 an officer, Desi Balthasar, who would actually go on to become uh, president of, 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 of Suriname when I was living there uh, um, uh, in the 2010s. And uh, the Maroons, uh, again, this is a, a very huge topic, I won't get into so much the detail, but but suffered incredibly, including massacres um, under this. It was extraordinarily disruptive to Maroon society in Suriname. And part of the broad takeaway that many of my respondents, my, my research respondents had, who had lived through that period, were like, you know, in the end, our traditional systems weren't up to the task like of, of protecting us in this horrific crisis. And also we were isolated. Nobody in the world even knew who we were, let alone, you know, uh, 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 trying to help us out. And so, um, you know, in the end, the dictatorship fell and, uh, and you know, the Maroons were able to, to reincorporate themselves to a greater or lesser degree. But out of those experiences, there was a sense that they needed to, to modernize. And in fact, the Maroons in Suriname have a distinct strength that is lacking in Jamaica, and that is the strength of numbers, demographics. The last time I checked on the on the census figures, it was something 20 to 25 percent of the Surinamese population are Maroons. And not wow. only that, not only that, but they have a multi-party parliamentary system, a multi-party de um, um, democratic structure in the country, such that the Maroons are able to form their own political parties and actually mm. like win uh, plenty of seats in parliament, unlike the Jamaican context where it's Jamaican Labour, it's a two-party system, Jamaican Labour Party, People's National Party, and if you're not in one of them, then forget it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Interesting so, though, very interesting. Yeah. And a uh, couple of things like well, one, uh, Southern Arm, you know, Guyana, mm -hmm. these were they were the same place at one time with I'm sure. Yes. Guyana, yeah. Southern Arm. So in Guyana, are you aware of like was the any maroons there or did they move to they, they were basically with it being the one geographical place, was it people from Guyana? The Maroons were more on Southern Arm side, or was it yes. the in Guyana, would you say, were they on more towards Southern Arm? Well, no, that's a very good question. Uh, yeah. One of the dynamics in Guyana, and it's often actually used as a case study to compare each other, that um, the, so although initiated in the Dutch Empire, uh, both Suriname and Guyana, eventually the British, um, uh, you know, by the, the mid 1700s, take the, the Dutch colony and start administering it themselves. And for reasons that you know i i can't get into in so much detail uh right now but the the british were more effective at cutting off the stem of marinage people fleeing the plantation and i understand that this had to do with alliances uh with uh indigenous communities so this happened in suriname as well but you know yeah. Empire divides and conquers. And so yeah. you set up one alliance with somebody to help you beat somebody else, even if you're not actually on the same side. So it was that type of dynamic leading up to the fact that in Guyana, the main form of resistance, the more prominent form of resistance, then became plantation uprisings, of course, which, uh, which uh, like Berbice, you know, which uh, uh, the Berbice uprising, which Guyana became uh, very famous for, unlike the more slow 
royal that that the slow boil that happened in in Suriname where where people little by little or sometimes in greater numbers fled to the interior and the Dutch army was just incapable in those type of geographic conditions of really uh, defeating uh, those societies so, well one of my granddads actually my granddad uh, my mom said was born in Trinidad and his mm. father was born in Guyana and it was actually babies and Georgetown that's the relative yeah. there I mean, I've got yeah. Nigerian from my father's side, but right. just um, right. on the Caribbean side. So, interesting when you mentioned babies as well, because I wasn't even aware of any of these uprisings. Yes. So, he told me something there. Yeah, so that is often, um, uh, you know, again, the colonial powers did anything they could do to stop Marinage because it was such an existential uh, threat. And, you know, it, I, I should say, it wasn't only because of the 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 specific destruction to the plantation economy that Marinage entailed, you know, not only, well, you're losing your captives, nobody, they're not working for you anymore. And then they're probably destroying things in the process or raids of the plantation by Maroon groups, but also just the example that a Maroon society set, right? Like imagine, imagine being an enslaved person uh, and, and, you know, you're, it, uh, under your conditions of captivity, the 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 plantation master is doing everything in his power to tell you, oh, you're nothing. You there's not there's no way out for you. You know, you you just accept your lot. Uh, uh, you're never gonna get anything better than this. Um, um, you know, it's the the archetype. They they wanted docile people. You know, to and that was always a myth. But but the resistance the motivation to resistance is even more accelerated by knowing well wait a second those people fled and they 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 beat your army you know so so now, i can do the same thing another, you know, another it was, interesting it was thing. an ideological threat yeah. yeah another interesting thing i, I know what guyana has the amazon rainforest as yes. part of it so the southern um have is the amazon run into southern as well yes, yes. The reason actually why yeah, yeah reason why i'm asking that is because when people are going to flee, I mean, that would be a perfect place as long as you can deal with <laughs> the territory of the Amazon. That oh, yeah. would be a great place to flee and become isolated more. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, so roughly two thirds, you know, if, if we can, if we can envision Suriname kind of just shaped like a square, uh, yeah. roughly two thirds of the bottom part away from the coast at the top um, is the upper reaches of the Amazon rainforest. That's the it. ideal place to be oh. hiding and yeah. fighting guerrilla war. We could say it's actually, you know, somewhat similar, uh, although smaller scale to the interior of Jamaica too. And I actually want to bring back for a second the, the, you know, relation with indigenous people um, yeah. in this regard. So uh, I'll start in Jamaica. Um, for a very long time, and it's still somewhat within dominant historical narratives, the sense was that, oh, Columbus arrived and just the Spanish basically immediately wiped out the, the what we used to call Arawaks, and now we, we more correctly call Taino, uh, uh, indigenous societies there. And so because of that complete genocide, there's no way African captives could have ever, you know, met an indigenous person. Well, we know now that that is, is extremely unlikely for two reasons. It's in the Maroons, Jamaican Maroons' own oral histories that the first time Maroons, the first people People fled, went and found the Tainos, linked up with them, and they taught them how to survive in that specific climate and that region and what they would need to do, you know, and eventually merge with those societies. And when I was in Akompong, uh, uh, another scholar, uh, Jada Torres, um, did a genetic study of the of of the Akampong community and found a statistically significant amount of of Amerindian you know north like like American native uh, uh, genes yeah. and so how would that happen if there had been no encounter? Well, funny uh, enough, you mentioned about well what we call like DNA and yeah. or history. Yeah. Could my yeah. granddad who's from Trinidad? He was talking about we have Cara bloodness or Arawak blood yeah. and stuff like that. And then later on, we did like a DNA ancestry and see Amerindian, part, like small bits of Amerindian. So it's like he already knew through oral history. Yeah. And then that just double confirmed it with the DNA ancestry. So it's shown you that like many people 
you know, there was communities mixing together from indigenous Calibs or Tianos and yes. Arawaks with um, Africans, you know, and same with the Spanish or whoever was there, there was people, people mixed that got out, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. And it's Especially even more unified. direct. Yeah, yeah, precisely. And it's even more direct in Suriname, where the Dutch colonial archives and their records, you know, specifically complain that, oh, our black captives are running away and the natives are helping them, you know, do it. Yeah. So, so, yeah, like, like there was common cause, you know, like what I said about about uh, Guyana, you know, it's it's always a complex history here that, you know, at times, uh, the colonizer tried to divide and conquer. Uh, sometimes they were successful, sometimes not. And, and um, you know, at least in the case of Suriname, it, it would seem that at least in the formative period of Marinage, there was very tight alliances uh, uh, between the escaped captives, the Maroons, and, and native folks there. And I think that resonates to this day where there is, you know, again, these aren't the same communities. Um, they are, they do see themselves and are seen as different ethnicities but again it's still a lot of common cause um, um definitely common cause in Suriname. yeah and it totally makes sense um it'd be common sense to try to un unify you have a common enemy and a yeah. common struggle you yeah, know it's, so it, it makes sense yeah it totally makes sense i think but um really enjoyed this discussion today i've learned a lot of you and um this was wonderful great, James. great deal of knowledge great deal of knowledge i understand that you know where um, you have to get on with your day, just like us all. But I really appreciate it. And, you know, in the future, I'd definitely love to bring you back on because, you know, Any time I, I would, <laughs> I really enjoyed our conversation. I would love to come back. Not even, not even one minute of it or one second of it boring. It was a, I really enjoyed you. <laughs> You've got the character also. So I really appreciate that anyway. This is James DeBone, Discovered and Dedicated to Original Peoples. And Robert Connell, I want to thank you very much. And we will do this again. Thank you very much, my brother. It's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you. You have a good day. Thank you. you. Too. Peace.